Epilogue Dusk The preceding first-person oral account of Ajahn Jia's life ends with the 1984 trip to Changrong Cave. Most of the description that follows, chronicling the final twenty years of his life, was provided by the editors of the original Thai edition of, of Gold Wrapped in Rags. These compilers either told their version of the events that happened during those years, or quoted accounts gleaned from the comments made by Ajahn Jia's contemporaries. In the following epilogue, I have combined the sequence of events that the editors described in detail and elaborated on those stories with descriptions collected from other sources to bring the chronicle of Ajahn Jia's life and practice to an inspirational conclusion. Ajahn Jia returned from Changrong Cave having made a decision about his future role in the forest Sangha, but without a plan for how to realize it. However, his old friend, Ajahn Mahabua, was already one step ahead of him. A long-time lay disciple of his had recently purchased a tract of land in Patum Thani province and offered the property to him in the hope that he would build a forest monastery at the site. By the time the two Ajahns met again in 1984, Ajahn Mahabua had already determined that Ajahn Jia was the only monk he trusted to head up the project and make it a success. Not only did he feel it was time for Ajahn Jia to have a monastery of his own, but he also believed that his character had the rigor and resolve needed to transform a piece of land on Thailand's central lowlands into a forest monastery in the style of Ajahn Mun. To honor their venerated teacher, Ajahn Jia decided to name the new monastery Buridatta Patipat Arama Forest Monastery, Buridat To being Ajahn Mun's formal monastic ordination name. Both Ajahn Mahabua and Ajahn Jia had put their lives on the line in the service of Ajahn Mund and his teachings. They shared in that inspiring experience and understood its transformative qualities. Among that generation of Ajahn Mund's disciples, Ajahn Mahabua had been one of the most successful at replicating the intensity and strictness of wilderness training inside the confines of an established monastic center. Ajahn Jia agreed to put down roots in Patum Thani under the condition that Ajahn Mahabua lend his strength and advice to get the project off the ground. In 1984, Ajahn Jia moved his old and aching body to Patum Thani, where he planned to drag a new generation of forest monks, kicking and screaming, back to the old ways of Dutanga training. But first, he had to build the basic infrastructure for a functioning monastic community. The land that he had been offered measured about fifty acres in total. Much of the property was covered with pine forest that had an abundance of thick foliage and limited undergrowth. A smaller section of the property was open pasture. Another section consisted of fallow rice fields where the mud walls that retained the rainwater needed to grow rice followed the contours of the land in large rectangular patterns. Those low earthen walls also served as raised walkways between the fields. The open land was bordered on two sides by a shallow canal. The environment certainly had potential, but much work would be needed to shape many different environments into a viable monastic living space. With the help of local devotees, Ajahn Jia set to work, first building a simple abbot's residence, a small bamboo hut placed at the edge of the pine forest. He constructed the hut using four wooden posts to support a raised floor and a thatched roof made of woven coconut fronds. The walls consisted of old and frayed monks' robes hung like curtains to shield the four sides. From this cool, breezy platform, Ajahn Jia surveyed the farmland in front of him and contemplated how to incorporate the open spaces into the overall monastic ground plan, so that the pine forest behind him would not feel like an island of forest encircled by a sea of tamed fields. Fortunately, a group of dedicated engineers volunteered to offer their services. Together with Ajahn Jia, they drew up plans to fill the sunken portions of the rice fields between the mud walls with compacted earth, thus leveling the land area so that any water that did not sink into the soil would run off into the canals instead of collecting in the fields. It also opened the possibility of reforesting the undeveloped pasture and field areas. 
Since tree saplings often take decades to grow to a mature height, the earth-moving work became their first priority. The rice fields were positioned in a wide area that spread out on both sides of the entrance road. A John Gia's crew brought in excavating equipment to dig out earth from the adjacent pasture. The fresh soil was used to fill each rectangular section of the rice field to the top of the low wall. When one section had been fully compacted, a dump truck drove over it to begin depositing soil into the next section. By the time the job had been completed, the ground level of the entire area had been raised above the water level in the canals, which helped to prevent future flooding. The large holes left in the ground after the earth was removed became rainwater ponds. When work on the infrastructure began in earnest, a group of Ajahn Jia's energetic monastic disciples joined the effort, prompting the team to build more bamboo huts in the shelter of the pine forest. They also erected a small pavilion where the monks would gather in the morning for the meal and in the evening for instruction and meditation. Despite the unusual workload, Ajahn Jia made a point of maintaining the basic framework of a monastic routine as much as possible. At first the group had no building materials and very few tools. When Ajahn Jia found old, rusting, corrugated tin roofing or used lumber that had been thrown away to rot, he conjured up ways to reuse these items. Because he abhorred wastefulness, Ajahn Jia mended broken tools himself and put them back into service. Rocks that had been sledgehammered to the consistency of gravel were used to pave the entrance road. Under a shaded lean-to built in the open pasture in front of Ajahn Jia's hut, bricks and mortar were utilized to construct a blacksmith's forge where he started making his own tools. Firing the forge with dead wood from the forest floor, he would heat up pieces of scrap metal until they were red-hot and hammer them into axes, hatchets, machetes, and hoes, which he would fit with sturdy hardwood handles. As the years passed, more and larger permanent structures were constructed to complete the institutional requirements of an official monastic compound. The dedicated monks who had helped Ajahn Jia build the monastery eventually moved away seeking more secluded locations to further advance their meditation practice. They were replaced by younger, less experienced monks lacking the same wisdom and judgment, monks who needed to be thoroughly schooled in the basic principles of the Dutanga lifestyle, austerity, strict discipline, and strong concentration. The longer a monk stays in the same place, the more he puts down roots. Because the monastic community relies on donations, a monk can easily become beholden to the lay devotees who make daily offerings of food and refreshments. Wealthy devotees often make large donations to the building fund, giving them a vested interest in the success of the monastery. They usually want the buildings to be grand, impressive, and pleasing to the eye. When the donors visit the monastery, they notice features that displease them, so they lobby the abbot to build structures that are more attractively designed to replace the old and still functional but less attractive ones. Beautiful monastic buildings require daily cleaning and maintenance, tasks which consume hours of a monk's daily routine that could be more suitably spent in meditation. Ultimately, it is the abbot's responsibility to oversee construction and maintenance issues while also supervising the monks in their daily schedule from the wake-up call at 3 a.m. until late into the night. That extra workload can be exhausting for an elderly monk. Because Ajahn Jia's monastery was located within driving distance of Bangkok and its sprawling suburbs, food offerings were delivered directly to the monastery to supplement the food that the monks collected on alms round. As time passed and the monastery's reputation spread, more donors showed up each day bringing larger quantities of good quality food. Fine rice and delicious curries soon became the norm. Consequently, the monks had to cope with a sumptuous meal and a full stomach each morning, a recipe for a mind full of sloth and torpor. Ajahn Jia did not begrudge the monks the fine food, but its wide variety was a far cry from the food of his days living with Ajahn Mon. 
he had remained with a John Mon for three rainy seasons and four dry seasons, subsisting for the most part on just rice and bananas. Unfortunately, he was allergic to most of the food that villagers offered in the north and the northeast. When no bananas were offered, he resorted to eating just plain rice, a diet that tended to cause indigestion and painful constipation. Because stomach medicines were unavailable in the wilderness, he was sometimes forced to stick two fingers down his own throat to induce vomiting, just to clear out his churning stomach. He said that his index and middle fingers were the medicine he never failed to carry with him in those days. A John Gia sometimes felt he was raising young, domesticated Dutanga monks, who, after enjoying a sumptuous meal, wandered from the main pavilion back to their huts to take a nap. Laziness had crept into their minds with its mallet raised, ready to sound the death knell for the Buddha's austere ascetic practices. Fit and healthy bodies strolled around the monastery grounds with weak and flabby minds in charge. Even the birds and squirrels looked plump and overfed. In the past, the great teachers in Ajahn Jia's tradition, from Ajahn Sao and Ajahn Man on down, played the role of forest tigers to spur their disciples' innate virtues into action, inspiring in them the motivation and the courage to confront the jungle of unruly thoughts and emotions in their minds. One roar from the tiger's mouth sent chills up the spine and demanded unerring vigilance. How many of those fierce tigers were left? Not many. Most of those who remained had lost the spring in their step and the loud, deep growl in their throat but they still had the roar in their hearts, if only their disciples could become aware of it. Instead, that later generation of Dutanga monks seemed to have forsaken a life of greater hardship to follow the path of least resistance, an attitude completely at odds with those great monks of the past. At that point in his life, Ajahn Jia's teaching had lost its hard edge. But then again, blunt force did not seem to have the same effect that it had with previous generations. Nonetheless, he had to acknowledge that some of his students might be capable of achieving significant breakthroughs in their meditation if he played the role of the tiger and made them endure austerities severe enough to open their eyes to the advantages of wilderness practice. If he left them to their own devices, simply allowing them to continue on as they had, it was clear that their eyes would remain closed for the rest of their lives. If they were to die without seeing the light, they would certainly have squandered a golden opportunity to break free of birth and death and experience the bliss of supreme happiness. For that reason, Ajahn Jia was vociferous in urging his students to take the meditation skills they had developed while practicing with him and trek into the country's remaining wilderness areas, where they could hone those skills to perfection and test their ability to cope with difficulties until they found a way through the unruly jungle of their worldly attitudes and opinions. After working for many years to create Buridatta Forest Monastery in the spirit of Ajahn Man and the Dutanga forest tradition that he championed, Ajahn Jia felt the need to refresh himself with a period of solitude and silence. Aware of this intention, a group of senior disciples volunteered to accompany their aging teacher on a return tour of the wilderness caves in Tak province. After visiting various caves in the region, the group finished its tour deep in the jungle at a cave known as Inta Nin. The trail leading up to Inta Nin cave was so narrow that they almost expected it to peter out among the rocks before it reached the entrance. Several times the trail crossed swiftly running streams on makeshift bridges made of rotting tree trunks. Both sides of the trail were dense with tangled vegetation and alive with the cries and chirping of birds and insects. As the trail became steeper, it sometimes assumed the shape of stairs worn into the rock. The cave's entrance came into view unexpectedly, as it was hidden from afar behind a veil of broadleaf jungle foliage. Intanin Cave was situated on a south-facing mountain slope, overlooking an unbroken view of valleys and mountains, some of which had summits that masked even loftier peaks beyond. A broad, arched opening, recessed into the rock face, allowed sunlight to reach the cave's back wall, creating a spacious domed chamber some sixty feet deep, a hundred feet wide, and thirty feet high. 
Because air entered the chamber and circulated freely, the atmosphere inside the cave was cool and dry at that time of year, in sharp contrast to the constant heat and humidity experienced at Buridatta Forest Monastery. Sheltering in caves had always given Ajahn Jia temporary respite from the dangers of camping out in the open. Wild animals, snakes, mosquitoes, and other insects mostly avoided the interior spaces of caves. Additionally, the stable temperatures of caves provided a cool habitat in the summer and a warm, dry shelter in the winter, making for an exceptional meditation environment. The silence Ajahn Jia experienced living in caves was so absolute that not only could he hear his own heart beating, but at times he felt he could sense the blood coursing through his arteries and veins. The entire atmosphere seemed to pulse with energy. Ajahn Jia told his disciples that the environment in and around Intanin Cave was so agreeable and therapeutic to his physical ailments that had he come across it before committing himself to Buridatta Forest Monastery, he might well have chosen to spend the remainder of his life there instead. Mind you, cave life is very Spartan. Seated in the seclusion of a cave, a solitary recluse has no company save that afforded by the trickling of water on the nearby rocks and the stirring of wild creatures in the woods. Hunger awaits him in the morning as he makes his way down the narrow trail in the half-light of dawn, at times in the pouring rain, to reach the nearest village settlement often located a long walk away. The meager food offerings placed in his bowl might consist only of lumps of plain rice with chili paste and some edible wild plants. Before long, he becomes as thin and haggard as a walking skeleton, with pallid skin drawn taut over his bony cheeks. His threadbare robes are patched by hand with scavenged pieces of cloth. Why would a monk take up forest dwelling as a way of life unless he was totally dedicated to the practice, begrudging neither his health nor his life? Such a monk does not simply grit his teeth and endure hardship and deprivation as some form of penance. Instead, he embraces the opportunity to test his resolve by confronting difficulties and using the powers of his mind to firmly resist any tendency to give up and accept defeat. The more demanding the challenge, the more spirited his response. That fighting spirit keeps a Dutanga monk steadfast on the path to liberation. Since many kinds of living beings exist at various levels of understanding, the path to liberation takes different forms some long and plodding, others short but arduous. The shortest and most direct path requires deliberately confronting difficult circumstances that provoke conflict and resistance in the mind of the meditator and using the challenge of overcoming them as motivation to intensify the practice. Living and practicing in wild places has unrivaled advantages as a way of life focused on throwing off the yoke of ignorance and attaining enlightenment as fast as possible. Such living requires a mindset that seeks the path of greatest resistance to counter the mind's usual inclination to settle for a path of least resistance to the strong pull of greed, aversion, and delusion. The wilderness is the perfect arena in which to experience a collision between the forces of oppressive defilements and the liberating power of Dhamma, which is the very purpose for which the Dutanga practices were initially created. Rather than avoiding defilements, seeking relief from them, or compensating for them. Liberation from suffering entails confronting the causes that give rise to suffering head-on and boldly eliminating them. Deliberately choosing the hardships of living alone in the wilderness is a practice that compels meditators to develop the inner strength needed to overcome their fear of ever-present dangers while rejecting the sensual appeal of physical ease and comfort. Ease and comfort are the enemies of genuine spiritual practice. When the mind is backed into a corner from which no escape is apparent, it is forced to take refuge in resources of courage and inner strength that were not known to have existed until the frightening circumstances arose to call them forth. Courage here does not refer to a lack of fear, but rather to using the heightened sense of alertness and the energizing qualities that fear evokes as a means of quickly centering the mind in present moment awareness where it can realize its highest potential. To live in the wildness of nature is to gain unique insights into the significance of the Buddha's teachings. 
residing alone in wilderness environments, had taught Ajahn Jia many profound lessons. Lessons in life's fleeting, transitory nature. Lessons in the pervasiveness of suffering in all forms of life. And lessons in how little control human beings have over the cycle of living and dying. When observed closely with a clear mind, nature reveals a core principle that governs all forms of life. Everything comes and goes. For instance, the forest contains dead and dying trees in different stages of decay, some slowly dying with dry brown leaves still clinging to life, some already dead with thin sheets of bark hanging from the trunk, some pale, smooth, dead trees with hardly any limbs left, and some long dead ones, rotten while yet standing, with the soft outer layer of sapwood eaten away by insects. Newly fallen dead trees lie side by side with rotten trunks that fell long ago. By the time their crumbling carcasses have disintegrated into the ground beneath them, faint traces of organic matter are all that remain on the ground's surface. From these moldering remains sprout fungi and new plant growth, carrying on the universal cycle of death, decay, and regeneration. Observing the life and death cycle of a forest tree serves as a reminder that the disintegration of a human corpse follows a similar process. When a corpse is left on the ground and exposed to the elements, it slowly rots in the warm sunshine. As time passes and decay accelerates, the skin darkens and the corpse begins to bloat. Eventually the skin ruptures and peels away, revealing the decaying flesh beneath. By the time maggots have eaten their fill of rotting tissue and vultures have scavenged the rest, most of the flesh and internal organs are gone. With the passage of time and exposure to the elements, the remaining scraps of tissue wash away, leaving only disjointed bones bleached white by the sun. In due course the bones begin to break up and disintegrate. These too will eventually wear away and turn to dust, finally reclaimed by the earth element from which they came. Although Ajanjia preferred to shelter in the relative security of forest caves, the untamed wilderness environment outside the cave reminded him of just how harrowingly painful the lives of the wild animals could be. Living alone in the wilderness, he witnessed the drama of animal existence unfold up close. The peril and uncertainty of animal life in the jungle never seemed to end. Every day was a fight for survival for everything from the largest tiger to the smallest rodent, either to find enough food to live on each day or to avoid the agony of being killed and eaten. Driven by hunger, many wild animals foraged and scavenged constantly. Continually on the lookout for threats to themselves and their young, forest animals could never fully let down their guard. Between struggling to stay alive and fighting to protect themselves and their offspring, Animals in their natural habitat embodied real-life instances of suffering and its consequences. Whether roaming widely or living a whole lifetime confined to a single tree, their existence was trapped in a vicious cycle of persistent craving and chronic deficiency. The lifespans of wild animals were generally short, their deaths often painful. Across the wilderness landscape, the ruthless scenes of a predator attacking and killing its prey were commonplace. Witnessing these deadly attacks firsthand, a John Gia could perceive the intensity of the fear experienced by vulnerable prey as predators stalked and ultimately slaughtered them. In one instance, he saw a tiger catch a deer and sink its sharp claws into the deer's rump, ripping through the hide and anchoring its grip deep in the muscle. The startled animal let out a disturbing, agonizing cry as its body hit the ground. An instant later the tiger sank its teeth into the deer's throat, choking off the sound of terror. Its vice-like jaws closed tightly to break the neck, leaving the deer to die a slow and excruciating death. Its young likely died soon after from starvation. He had seen hawks swoop down from the treetops, talons extended, to catch and kill squirrels running across the branches below and then use their hooked beaks to tear bite-sized pieces of flesh from the still-living animal to temporarily abate their hunger pangs. Leopards were fond of stalking and catching unsuspecting monkeys, which they ripped apart and ate on the spot. Bears had tremendous strength, 
and a dispassionate approach to killing any animal that crossed their path. They often began to feed immediately, without waiting for the prey to die. Starvation was a common cause of death for animals who were injured or aging. Eventually their bodies simply wore out, and they were no longer able to forage or stalk their prey. As death approached, their backbones stuck out grotesquely, and their intestines and stomachs were sunken through to the bone before they finally collapsed to the ground. The Dutanga monks with whom wild animals share their forest abode feel a deep kinship with all creatures in the natural world, which arouses in them a feeling that we are all one and the same. One in the sense that all living beings without exception are subjected to suffering in the course of being born, growing old, falling sick, and dying. Darkness and light, illness and health, and life and death are simply part of the back and forth of the impermanence of nature. The highs and lows of life center around personal feelings, but the natural world is completely apathetic to the feelings of living beings. It is not involved in nor influenced by personal sentiments. Dispassionate and impartial, it remains wholly indifferent to their happiness or suffering. Ajanjia found that living alone in the wilderness for an extended period was one of the best ways to learn Dhamma lessons from the natural world because what he witnessed there put the Buddha's teachings into clearer perspective. It made him realize how vast the world of sentient experience was and how profoundly insignificant the person called Jia was by contrast. The wilderness never gave a damn about him. The birth of his body added nothing to it. Its death would take nothing away from it. Body and mind were just a part of the same impersonal process of birth, decay, and death. There was no me or mine involved in that experience. Ajahn Jia's personal preferences had no control over the outcome of that process. In his contemplations of the natural world, he found only the absence of an intrinsic essence, and thus found nothing worthy of clinging or attachment. He felt he was merely a part of a moment in time in the wild, and he felt no need to identify with it. Trees, the sage observers of the natural world, like sentient living creatures, have life stages that include birth, growth, injury, disease, old age, and death. As trees go from birth to death, their physical forms change, as do their roles in the different communities of forest plants and wild animals. The oldest trees are living monuments of long-term survival that help keep forests alive by passing on their experience and hardiness to the other trees and plants in their environment. Woodland areas can be viewed as large communities of trees, each containing many different families that include infants, adolescents, mature adults, and venerated elders. Tree families in a forest community need their elders, as they are the source of the forest's resilience and renewal when it is faced with the ravages of wind and weather. Their cool shade encourages the growth and development of younger members. Their dead leaves enrich the forest floor, making it a fertile habitat for the birth and growth of future generations. Without this clearly noticeable effect of ancient trees, a community of trees cannot fully realize its natural potential. Like ancient trees in the forest of human history, towering figures like Ajahn Sao and Ajahn Man, who lived and practiced the ageless ways of wisdom, had remarkable knowledge and skills to pass on to their disciples. Few trees in the spiritual forest stood taller or offered more shade than these great masters. Their Bodhi leaves of wisdom which fertilized the ground of practice for future generations of practitioners, became indispensable for the long-term survival of the forest meditation tradition. The essence of that tradition, the single motivation that inspired it from the beginning and continues to influence the lives of those who practice it today, is the solemn resolve to attain the end of all suffering by the most direct and effective means possible. The monks that represent the tradition thrive in environments of adversity, hardship and struggle. Able to withstand and recover quickly from difficult conditions, these monks open a path to spiritual transcendence for future generations. 
as the group of monks was about to depart from Intanin Cave for their return trip to Buridatta Forest Monastery, Ajahn Jia gathered his trusted disciples around him in the cave's large chamber and assigned them a sacred duty. He solemnly relayed to them instructions for his final passing. When the time came, he was to be brought there to die in solitude and silence. He charged them with the responsibility of carrying his body back to the cave and leaving him there alone to finally shed that old, worn-out skin bag forever, leaving flesh, guts, blood, and bones there in the company of maggots and vultures where they belonged. When fate finally passed judgment, however, Ajahn Jia was denied the opportunity to return to his preferred final resting place in the heart of Thailand's northern wilderness. He was held back by the infirmities that beset his body and sapped his energy as dusk began to settle over the life of a monk whose indefatigable spirit knew few definable limits. Ajahn Jia could not recall any single moment when he noticed that his body was starting to let him down, when he could no longer assume that the strength and energy in his shoulders and arms would be there when he needed them. His legs, once a source of almost superhuman stamina, had succumbed to weakness. The agility needed to jump clear of a potential danger on the trail had gradually disappeared. Lacking the balance to keep his footing on uneven terrain forced him to place each step he took in the woods more deliberately. Accepting that the debilities of old age hampered his mobility, he resigned himself to planning his movements more thoroughly and pacing his exertions more thoughtfully. When he was no longer as able-bodied as before, he simply settled comfortably with what abilities still remained. Despite his failing physical strength, his heart continued to be strong, his mind sharp. The fierce resolve he had displayed since he was a child showed no signs of waning. The unbowed spirit that drove his body simply figured out how to get more out of less, how to adapt to physical limitations instead of resigning himself to them. He welcomed the challenges of old age with the same unwavering determination that he had exhibited when facing adversity wandering through Thailand's uncharted wilderness areas. Ajahn Jia's declining health forced him to adapt by having young monks help him work the forge and by working shorter hours. He no longer had the quick reflexes and clear eyesight to hammer red-hot steel rods as precisely as he once had, so he adjusted the height and angle of his arm to make more solid contact. As aging overtook him, he exerted himself with a degree of caution, a sense that over time his limits had changed. Backing down from a rigorous challenge was not a cause for discouragement or regret. Nonetheless, he never shied away from the physical tasks he could still perform. For the rest of Ajahn Jia's life, the forge remained behind his residence, ready for use. He would sit hunched over the anvil, struggling to pull the hammer down hard onto the steel while making sure that his strike was accurate. The natural wear and tear of old age had caused his spinal discs to become less flexible and more prone to tears and ruptures. One afternoon, a relatively minor twisting motion of his back as the hammer met the anvil caused one of his discs to rupture. The protruding disc pressed against the sciatic nerve, triggering severe pains stretching down his right leg that worsened when he was active. He adapted to this handicap by taking frequent breaks and adjusting his posture from time to time to ease the strain. Because he had difficulty bending or straightening his back, he avoided lifting the heavy burlap sacks of charcoal that fueled the fire in the forge, instead relying on his disciples for assistance. Once Ajahn Jia had settled permanently at Buridatta Forest Monastery, more lay supporters took advantage of his continuous presence to pay respects to him in person and offer donations. Always frugal with monetary offerings, he would only spend what was necessary to provide for the monastery's upkeep. The rest he would have his steward deposit in the monastery's account, hoping to one day repay the debt of gratitude he owed Ajahn Man by building a memorial stupa, or chedi, to commemorate his supreme virtues. Within a reliquary to be placed inside its uppermost spire, Ajahn Jia planned to enshrine a tooth relic that Ajahn Man had given him almost sixty years before. 
Ajahn Jia was given the tooth several days after he began his apprenticeship with Ajahn Mon in Chiang Mai province. Early one morning, Ajahn Jia carried a basin of warm face-washing water to Ajahn Mon's hut. When he arrived, Ajahn Mon was cleaning his teeth. Suddenly the tooth next to the one he was brushing popped out and fell on the floor. Ajahn Mon calmly retrieved the tooth and, stretching out his palm, handed it to Ajahn Jia with the words, Here, you take it. Since then, Ajahn Jia had treated the tooth as a sacred relic and kept it with him wherever he traveled. Ajahn Jia suspected that Ajahn Mon could see into the future and knew intuitively that one day his young disciple was destined to build a chedi in his honor, wherein the tooth relic would be enshrined. Ajahn Jia was in no hurry to begin construction. He was content to wait for an appropriate opportunity when the funds being saved were sufficient to cover the full cost of construction. Only then would he proceed. Finally, in February of 1996, the Chetty's cornerstone was laid, and work began on what turned out to be a six-year project. An engineering feat of love and respect, in which Ajahn Jia was personally involved from beginning to end. Although hampered by the effects of the herniated disc, Ajahn Jia threw himself into every phase of the construction project, which gradually progressed to completion during the same period that his physical health was slowly deteriorating. The project's first year was devoted to laying the foundation. A solid concrete and steel foundation was anchored deep in the ground to support the structure, which would stretch 72 feet in width and rise to a height of 120 feet at its peak. By then, the Ajahn Mon Memorial Chedi had become the main activity around which the monastery centered. His excruciating back pain notwithstanding, Ajahn Jia inspected the foundation site every day, supporting his back with a long staff as he walked to and from the building area. During that period he experienced bouts of blurred vision due to glaucoma in both eyes and the painful symptoms of an enlarged prostate. He also underwent two surgical procedures to relieve pressure on the sciatic nerve and reduce his spinal discomfort. In defiance of the changes to his health, Ajahn Jia remained steadfast. Chetty construction forged ahead on schedule. Each day the architectural drawings were unfolded and laid flat on a table so that he could inspect construction details as work on the ground progressed. Ajahn Jia requested that the Chetty be designed in the architectural style of the ancient Sukhothai kingdom, a style characterized by a tall, narrow central tower ending at its apex with a long, thin spire emerging from a spherical lotus bud. The structure was designed to maintain the traditional form of Thai chedis while taking advantage of contemporary building materials such as reinforced concrete and marble cladding. The eight-sided wall of the chedis' first story bore four wide double-door entrances, one facing each cardinal direction, below which broad marble staircases rose to meet the polished golden teak doors. The doors led into the base's inner sanctuary, which housed a memorial shrine with a life-size statue of a John Mund seated in meditation on the altar. Each surface of the four-sided marble-clad dome that extended up from the center of the base contained a large window opening sealed by a massive pair of hinged teakwood panels. Soaring gracefully above each window was a marble archway bearing identical lotus-leaf motifs, their lower edges flaring up like wings. From the middle of the dome, a fluted marble tower ascended to the Chetty's peak, a gold-plated spire containing a John Mond's tooth and many other sacred relics. The entire Chetty sat on a spacious concrete platform that could be ascended from any direction by four broad stairways leading upward and connecting to a second set of stairs near the doors. The elegance of its design was found not only in its seamless layer of white marble covering its swinging teak doors, and its precisely detailed stonework motifs, but also in the well-grounded strength of its overall conception. In 1998, as construction of the Chetty's base level was concluding, Ajahn Jia stumbled while walking around the building site and wrenched his left foot, breaking the big and second toes. After doctors put a cast on his foot, 
he insisted on hobbling through the monastery compound every day. Determined to get the most out of what was left of his ailing body, he conversed loudly with bystanders and shouted instructions to the construction crew. The adjustments Ajahn Jia made to prolong his ability to move freely offset the negative impact of his physical restrictions while he oversaw the completion of the Chetty's marble dome and the fluted marble tower that rose from its center. His daily exercise routine included an early morning session laying on his back and vigorously punching, then kicking into the air above him. While he performed this exercise one morning in early 2001, he suddenly felt burning and tingling sensations running down the left side of his body, which led to a loss of control of the coordination and muscle functions on that whole side. Soon afterward, numbness and paralysis set in. Ajahn Jia was rushed to the hospital where doctors discovered that he had suffered a hemorrhagic stroke caused by a ruptured blood vessel bleeding in the brain. The pooling blood had produced swelling and severe damage to some of the brain tissue. The hemorrhaging was so serious that the doctors were forced to operate immediately to save Ajahn Jia's life. Surgery was performed through the skull to remove the accumulated blood and relieve pressure on the brain, which stabilized his condition. Although a section of the brain had been injured beyond repair, draining the fluid helped prevent further degeneration. A week later, however, the hemorrhaging resumed, coalescing to form a life-threatening blood clot that required a second operation to remove it. Ajahn Jia was forced once again to adapt his lifestyle to new limitations. Although being bedridden isolated him even further from the ongoing Chedi construction, he insisted that his attendants push him around the monastery compound in a reclining wheelchair. With the left side of his body paralyzed and the right side in constant pain from the herniated disc, he managed to carry on with an undaunted spirit. However, the level of disability brought on by illness and old age became increasingly evident to the monks living at the monastery, who could see that their teacher's former vitality and alertness were rapidly waning. Speaking left him exhausted, as though the immense energy he had once poured into his teaching activity had been used up. Eventually, Ajahn Jia's students had to accept that he was slowly dying. His passion for the rigors of the Dutanga way of life had finally caught up with him. Despite everything he endured, Ajahn Jia did not feel helpless in the face of misfortune any more than he felt himself to be a victim of the ongoing effects of old age. At long last, only the Chetty's gold-plated top spire remained unfinished. Every day, Ajahn Jia was taken to inspect the preparations being made to transfer the many sacred relics he had collected into a hollow cavity inside the spire where they would be enshrined for posterity. In February 2002, in a grand ceremony held at Buridatta Forest Monastery, Ajahn Jia formally consecrated the sacred contents of the spire before it was lifted to the Chetty's pinnacle. Leaning back in the wheelchair with his legs raised and using his still-functioning right hand, Ajahn Jia performed the symbolic gesture of pulling on a ceremonial cord attached to the spire as a crane lifted the sixteen-foot-tall cone to its final resting place atop the uppermost marble lotus bud, thus concluding construction of the Ajahn Manburidatta Memorial Chedi. In December of 2002, Ajahn Jia began to experience chest pains and shortness of breath, accompanied by long bouts of fatigue and weakness. An echocardiogram test revealed that he suffered the symptoms of chronic heart failure, indicating that his heart was failing to pump as much blood as the body needed to function normally. He remained in the hospital to receive treatment in the hope that therapy would slow his worsening heart condition. Eventually he returned to the monastery, where the treatment continued. Nonetheless, Ajahn Jia's health continued its downward spiral as his physical decline gathered pace. In 2003, a chest X-ray revealed the white-gray mass of a lung tumor. A subsequent CT scan confirmed that the cancer had already reached a critical stage. Although there was no known cure for advanced lung cancer, with help from his medical team and conscientious attention from his monastic attendants, his symptoms were manageable in the short term. 
The symptoms he experienced included a persistent dry cough that worsened with deep breathing, followed by intermittent bouts of labored breathing and wheezing. Skin sores that refused to heal broke out all over his body. He was often plagued by stretches of bowel and bladder dysfunction, as well as periods of relentlessly coughing up bloody mucus. A combination of the malignant tumor and the symptoms of congestive heart disease caused inflammation in the air sacs lining both lung cavities, which led to a dangerous buildup of fluid in his lungs. The weight of the fluid prevented the lungs from expanding, causing gasping and breathlessness to increase. To relieve the pressure, doctors inserted a wide needle attached to a drainage tube into a John Gia's chest, which allowed the fluid to slowly drain into a container. So much fluid had collected in Ajahn Gia's lungs that it took hours to drain them completely. Although this procedure was repeated several times, making it easier for him to take deeper breaths, it did nothing to treat the cancer. Consequently, his prognosis continued to worsen. Despite the uncertainty surrounding Ajahn Gia's prolonged infirmity, he exuded unflappable equanimity, he appeared serenely isolated from the decrepitude of a body that was rapidly breaking down, its energy receding as though the life force that sustained its existence was preparing to depart. A John Gia's fearless personality shone steadily through those twilight hours of rampant aging. By the time dusk fell on August 23, 2004, the transition phase from living to dying was rapidly progressing. A John Gia's lungs had become so compromised that the oxygen level in his blood had gradually tapered off to the point where life itself appeared to be draining from his body. Over the next few hours, his blood's oxygen saturation dipped below 80% and continued to drop. As the spaces between breaths increased, his pulse and blood pressure became fainter. Eventually, insufficient oxygen remained to sustain the vital organs. The lungs and brain failed in quick succession, completing the physical process of dying. At 10.55 p.m., the doctors determined that the life of Ajahn Jia Chundo had finally come to an end. Although his death occurred far from his chosen cave in the wilderness, it also took place free from the entanglement of an ordinary mind trapped in the untamed wilderness of Sangsara. When the average person's physical and cognitive functions deteriorate to the point where they can no longer sustain life, the knowing awareness that instilled life into both body and mind at conception and maintained its living presence throughout periods of growth, sickness, and aging finally vacates, leaving a lifeless corpse behind. The knowing awareness associated with that person carries with it the effects of all the intentional good and bad thoughts, speech and actions committed during that lifetime as an ongoing legacy for the future. At the culmination of one life, this karmic legacy is duly transferred to the conscious presence of a living being in the next life. Stated in another way, delusion creates the conditions for karma and its consequences, which themselves determine the circumstances and conditions of the next birth. This delusion imparts a karmic blueprint that outlines all the qualities and character traits contained in that individual's karmic legacy, which is integrated into the knowing awareness that sustains life in the body and mind of a developing fetus. At birth, the karmic cycle continues with more actions and their karmic results, ad infinitum. This recurring pattern represents the never-ending cycle of sangsaric existence. The knowing awareness has no personal characteristics, however. It is not born, nor does it die. It is timeless, boundless, and radiant, but its true nature is obscured by mental defilements and clouded by delusion. This delusion creates within that awareness a center or focal point of the knower. The existence of that false center produces an individual perspective which is the nucleus of self-identity. This self forms perceptions of duality, the knower and the known, and from there, awareness flows out to produce physical and mental perceptions and all sensory experiences. 
The feedback from this outflow then reinforces the knower's sense of individuality by creating the false impression that there exists a world of experience separate from the one who knows it. The personal perspective begins with currents of mental activity that flow outward to create the entire sensory world, the world of conditioned phenomena. Therefore, all physical and mental phenomena exist relative to the knower, the awareness that perceives them. As such, they are merely conditional manifestations that the knower has brought into being and imbued with meaning. Gradually, these manifestations become incorporated into the knower's sense of its own identity. Thus, the known becomes enmeshed with the knower, trapping the knower in a web of self-delusion. The knower is reduced to depending on its own manifestations to provide a sense of continuity to its perceived existence. Therefore, although awareness knows, it knows falsely, and it knows falsely because of the fundamental delusion of self-belief lying at the center of the knower that influences all of its experience. That central belief projects a concrete sense of self into the activities of body and mind and into perceptions of the six sense fields. That self-awareness created the person, known as Ajahn Jia Chundo. Thus we can say that Ajahn Jia, the person, was at the most fundamental level, a delusion. He had no existence outside of conditional appearances. He also had no existence independent of self-awareness. Ultimately, his personality was a creation of deluded knowing. When that delusion was ultimately destroyed through insight into the nature of the processes described above, the focal point of the knower disintegrated, which caused the self-perspective to disappear from awareness altogether. With the disappearance of self-identity, all conditional appearances manifested by the knower disappeared as well. Once awareness had been purified of all delusion, a John Gia, the person, could no longer be found. The conditional appearances of his body and mind continued to function according to those karmic causes and influences put into effect prior to his awakening, when delusion was still in control. As a result, both the karmically created conditional appearances and the unconditioned awareness coexisted from the moment that he saw through this delusion to become an arahant, on until his body and mind eventually succumbed to death. The death of an arahant is unique, because when an arahant's body and mind disintegrate, no traces of the karmic consequences of past actions are left behind as a future legacy for rebirth. Once the center of self around which personal perspective coalesced has been destroyed, kama and its effects have nowhere to manifest. The self-perspective is revealed to be void and empty. Throughout Ajahn Jia's long life, the personality embedded in his body and mind retained its original course and dogged nature. The awareness that is separate from the person, however, had let go of the personal perspective and undergone a liberating transformation. When the old and torn rags of his personal identity fell away at death, awareness radiated like pure gold of the highest quality. No alloys or other contaminants remained to tarnish its brilliance. Consequently, it is impossible to compare the pure awareness of an arahant with the heap of soiled rags known as body and mind. It was in this context that Ajahn Mun had dubbed Ajahn Jia gold wrapped in rags. With penetrative wisdom, Ajahn Mun saw directly through the ragged nature of his disciples' personality, perceiving the heart of gold that others were unable to recognize. The Ajahn Jia, who was born in 1916 and passed away in 2004, was a person endowed with body, feeling, memory, thought, and sense consciousness a human being with a personal history stretching from birth to death. His physical and mental functions formed the outward appearance with which he engaged the world around him. His physical features, actions, speech, and thoughts presented a rough and daunting figure of a man, whose dominating personality combined provocative behavior with fierce determination, a stubborn bull with the penetrating stare of a wild tiger. These character traits, inherited from his karmic legacy, formed the window dressing that cloaked his inner virtue. 
It took an exceptional teacher like a John Mon to pull back that curtain and uncover his vast spiritual potential. The beneficial effects of a John Gia's past comma enabled him to encounter a John Mon at an auspicious time in his development. Kama refers to the law of cause and effect. When we say that such and such is happening as a result of past kama, it can mean that what we experience now is an effect produced by causes rooted in our past actions. But the kama referred to above can be understood more fully by distinguishing between its two aspects. First, there is the kama involved in relation to another person, in a John Gia's case, between himself and a John Mon. The second, more individual aspect of Kama involved Ajahn Jia's diligent engagement in Dhamma practice in many previous lives under many different circumstances, the overall effect of which created an interest in and a natural attraction to Buddhist practice in his present life. So, the fact that Ajahn Jia had the good fortune to meet Ajahn Mon in his life was probably due to the ripening of a Dhamma relationship formed in past lives combined with a long-standing resolve to realize the truth of the Buddha's teachings, a resolve which had been developed during many lifetimes of dedicated practice. Although it was truly a blessing to have the good fortune to find an outstanding teacher, Ajahn Jia still had to create the right kind of kama to follow Ajahn Man and put his teachings into practice. It is one thing to set out on a spiritual journey with good intentions, and quite another to find the resolve, endurance, and wisdom to follow that path to the end. Even after encountering a John Mon and earnestly following his instructions, a John Jia inevitably met difficulties and frustrations along the path. But he never let those obstacles overshadow the liberating value of the path he had chosen. By investigating the hindrances he experienced along the way and using the resulting understanding wisely, a John Jia turned obstructions into unforeseen sources of strength and insight. After living for many years under a John Mon's tutelage, a John Jia understood why the Thai forest tradition places such a strong emphasis on the relationship between teacher and disciple, and just how essential that relationship is to making progress on the Buddhist path. Without his teacher's compassionate guidance, a John Jia would have had little prospect of realizing the full depth of the Buddha's liberating teachings. Ajahn Jia was born in an exceptionally auspicious time for authentic Buddhist practice. By virtue of his karmic background, it was almost inevitable that he would meet with the right conditions to further his spiritual progress. The early to mid-twentieth century was arguably one of the most remarkable periods of Buddhist practice in the entire modern era. Led by Ajahn Sao and Ajahn Man, with their revival of traditional Buddhist training methods, generations of Thai forest monks benefited from a renewed emphasis on strict discipline and time-honored ascetic practices to attain the highest Dhamma in an age when such an accomplishment was no longer thought possible. Prior to this period of revival, a popular opinion held that it was no longer possible to attain Nibbana. The best that could be expected of Buddhists in the modern era was that they faithfully observe moral precepts and steadfastly preserve Buddhist rituals. As a result of that conviction, the quality of monastic discipline had seriously deteriorated and authentic Buddhist meditation practices had been all but abandoned. Seeing the danger to the monastic traditions posed by this regression in monastic discipline, influential Thai monks spearheaded a reform movement in the 19th century that resulted in the formation of a new Thai monastic order called the Dhammayut Nikaya. One guiding principle of this new order was strict adherence to the Buddha's monastic code of conduct, or Vinaya. The insistence on strict compliance with the disciplinary rules at Dhammayut monasteries attracted the likes of Ajahn Sao and Ajahn Mand to ordain and prosper in this monastic lineage. In addition to strict discipline, the other principle that would set these two great teachers apart from their contemporaries was a renewed emphasis on the value of Dutanga ascetic practices recommended by the Buddha. This radical shift from a sedentary monk's respectable but unadventurous lifestyle to the rigorous austerities practiced daily by a wandering Dutanga monk became a turning point for re-establishing faith in the possibility of attaining the ultimate goal of the Buddha's teachings. Under Ajahn Mon's guidance, 
Forest Sangha communities were able to maintain the integrity of their communal spirit by emphasizing respect for traditional Buddhist values, while at the same time granting a measure of autonomy to individual monks by encouraging each to experiment with the Dutanga practices that best suited their temperament. The ascetic practices encouraged by the Buddha exert an intensified pressure on the attachments that create suffering. The criteria for deciding whether a practice should be adopted or not is how defiantly its use counteracts the power that the defilements exert on one's mind. The Dutanga monks of the Thai forest tradition who practiced these ascetic methods proved that, practiced correctly with their original intent, the Buddha's teachings were still capable of leading a person who applied the right intention, the right attitude, the right mindfulness, and the right effort to attain the right result. Indeed, it was often the ascetic practices undertaken as aids to meditation that were instrumental in instilling the rightness in those path factors. Such concerted opposition to the excesses of craving, aversion, and delusion is what the Buddha meant by the middle way. The Buddha stated that the middle way refers to the path of practice that is neither too lax nor too extreme. In other words, just right. But just right for what? just right to counter the mental defilements in whichever way they manifest. If the defilements are strong, the forces of Dhamma required to overcome them must be equal to the task. Then the forces of Dhamma must adjust their tactics and take courageous action to intensify their attack and drive the defilements back to the brink of total submission. This is the middle way in action. The forces of goodness battle the forces of evil by employing the most appropriate meditation practices for the occasion, the ones optimally suited to counter the strength of the opposition at each juncture in the battle until Dhamma finally emerges victorious. Among Dutanga monks intent on confronting the most resistant defilements, the Dutanga spirit they espoused spawned a variety of closely aligned ascetic practices. For fearless and intrepid monks like Ajahn Jia and his companions, these alternative observances became an indispensable part of intensifying their meditation for the purpose of tackling the most deeply entrenched defilements head-on with a winner-takes-all mentality. Ajahn Jia praised the exploits of Dutanga monks who, rather than settling for slow and steady progress, challenged themselves by choosing to confront hardship and fear directly as a means of intensifying their efforts in meditation. He admired many of Ajahn Mand's disciples for the innovative ways in which they broadened the scope of traditional Dutanga asceticism. Whenever their minds were gripped by fear, or whenever they felt drowsy, complacent, or discouraged, they devised and put into practice uniquely appropriate strategies that forced them to confront these problems in a way that demanded a quick and decisive resolution. It was their dedication to ascetic practices that hardened them into Dhamma warriors who possessed the unwavering courage to face dangerous and painful situations for the sake of ridding their minds of suffering. As a result, disciples of Ajahn Man who practiced in wilderness areas tended to make a special effort to seek out frightening locations to stimulate their meditation practice. Noticing that tigers regularly used a certain forest trail at night, such monks made a point of sitting on the ground right in the middle of that path. Some monks frequented village charnel grounds where corpses were cast away and wild animals were known to scavenge at night. Those monks who had an ingrained fear of ghosts deliberately spent nights meditating at cremation grounds deep in the forest in order to conquer that debilitating fear. Others, feeling lethargic, meditated while seated precariously on narrow ledges that extended over steep, rocky precipices, intending to take advantage of their fear of death to awaken concentration and arouse vigilance. The concentrated awareness that was achieved by all these innovative practices induced a state of increased alertness. That heightened awareness soon gathered into a single point of focus, which caused the mind to rapidly converge to a point of sublime stillness. In an instant, the mind was oblivious to all the fear and trepidation that had previously engulfed it. In place of these hindrances, a serene knowing essence arose, 
an awareness of pure, harmonious being so profound as to be indescribable. When the mind withdrew from that state, fear of death was often a thing of the past. It had been superseded by an incredible sense of courage the likes of which had never before been experienced. In the absence of that element of fear, the restless mind was reluctant to drop into the desired state of calm. Consequently, where Dhamma warriors sat in meditation on each occasion depended on the location where they felt the mind was most likely to quickly reach deep levels of samadhi. The Buddha compared the difficulties experienced on the path of practice to the arduous spiritual journey of a monk which eventually leads him to the banks of a mighty river that separates him from the land of freedom at the far shore. To attempt the crossing, he must construct a sturdy raft and pilot it skillfully with ingenuity, fortitude, and stamina. The raft is fashioned from the Dhamma practices taught by the Buddha, which the monk must diligently put to the test in his effort to complete the journey. He adapts the materials he uses to build the raft to the purpose of countering the hazards he expects to face on the river. From the many meditation methods that the Buddha taught, the monk chooses a set of practices that are uniquely suited to the mission. Supported by the raft while paddling deftly with his hands and feet, he feels confident he can eventually reach freedom's shore. A meditative life practiced for the purpose of attaining freedom from suffering resembles paddling a raft against the prevailing current of birth and death. If a practitioner does not tenaciously resist the current's momentum, he will soon find himself drifting sideways down the stream following the flow of continued existence and thus never reach the ultimate safety of Nibbana's shore. Fierce, unwavering determination must be maintained with every kick and stroke to prevent his mind from veering off course. Relying on the raft's stability to anchor concentration, a practitioner negotiates the needs and demands of crossing the mighty river, adjusting the mind to whatever obstructions it encounters. The mind moves through the perceptions of its awareness, like the river water coursing beneath the raft, flowing over fears and under cravings, around attachments and through delusions. It adapts its attention to the forms and moods of the hindrances it encounters on the journey, becoming sometimes deep, sometimes shallow, sometimes infused with light, and other times lost in shadow. Constantly gathering insights to resolve conflicts between the defiance of defilements and the principles of Dhamma, the practitioner pushes on, neutralizing strong headwinds and powerful undercurrents at every juncture of his passage. Once the Dutangas and other practices that constitute the raft have accomplished their mission, he abandons them at freedom's shoreline because they are no longer needed. Only then is he fully prepared to step off the raft and onto solid ground. We can imagine Ajahn Jia emerging from the wilderness, rooting his feet firmly on the river's bank, and staring with fierce and uncompromising determination at his destination on the opposite shore. Having carefully assessed what is required to make the crossing, he improvises a raft from materials that are available on the jungle floor. Cobbling together logs, branches, roots, and vines, and rigging them with a sail stitched together from threadbare monk's robes, he boldly pushes off from the bank and into the current of the mighty river. Strong headwinds soon push the raft off course, tearing the sail to shreds in the process. In response, Ajanjia strips off his shoulder cloth and sets to work paddling vigorously until he finds a way to steady the raft and regain the advantage. With diligent attention to detail, he learns to read the river and tame its shifting currents. During the crossing he endures stretches of torrential rain, blazing heat, and freezing temperatures, but he becomes so absorbed in the challenge that he forgets the conditions, forgets to sleep, and forgets to eat. Piloting his craft with only his arms and legs, Ajahn Jia advances undeterred until he arrives triumphantly at the far shore. Totally unfettered at last, he abandons the raft at the water's edge and steps to the ground, planting his bare and blistered feet firmly on terra firma, in the land of absolute freedom. The End <laughs>